In police crime museums all over Europe, there are items of evidence that have brought some of the world's worst criminals to justice. Behind every object in these black museums is a fascinating and sometimes macabre story. In today's murder investigations, police use the latest technology to track down and apprehend criminals. But at the turn of the century, when communications were limited, passports not required, and organizations such as Interpol not established, a fugitive could flee abroad to escape the clutches of the law. A sensational murder case changed all that. For in 1910, a man wanted for murder was dramatically captured by means of wireless telegraphy. It was the first time that transatlantic radio communication was used in a murder hunt, with police chasing the fugitives across the Atlantic Ocean. Because of this dramatic use of a new technology, the whole world became captivated by the case of Dr. Crippen. Today, Crippen's effigy still stands in London's famous waxworks museum, Madame Tussauds. As they descend into the Chamber of Horrors, past some of the most ghastly figures of world crime, visitors must wonder at this small, mild-mannered doctor whose alleged crime of murder and mutilation shocked society nearly a century ago. The story begins on the 9th of July, 1910, when a Scotland Yard police officer made a visit to a house in North London, 39 Hilldrop Crescent. He was making inquiries about a Mrs. Crippen, an American music hall singer. Cora Crippen had not been seen since the last day of January. In February, her husband, Dr. Crippen, had circulated news that his wife was desperately ill in America. Shortly afterwards, he announced her death. But several of her friends, wanting to know where she had been buried, became concerned when they could find no record of her death. Eventually, at the end of June, several of those friends contacted the police. When questioned about the matter, Dr. Crippen eventually admitted to Inspector Dew of Scotland Yard that he had made up the story of Cora's illness and death. In fact, he explained, she had left him for another man and gone back to live in their native America. He willingly allowed the inspector to search the house. Everything seemed in order. Though a little uneasy about the situation, Inspector Dew accepted Crippen's explanation and let matters rest. Inspector Dew would later receive much praise for his part in the Crippen case, but uh, Blue Serge, as he was known on account of his distinctive suit, could not in fairness count his initial investigation as his finest work. A couple of days later, he decided to make one more call on the doctor just to check a few facts, but he was too late. Crippen's maid informed him that the doctor had gone away Crippen's office confirmed that he had not been seen for hours, and neither had his young female typist. Inspector Dew decided on a more thorough search of Hilldrop Crescent. Working with a colleague, Dew dug up the garden. On the third day, they decided to take another look in the coal cellar. As Dew later wrote, the cellar held a peculiar fascination for me. It was at the bottom of a short, dark passage leading from the kitchen. Armed with a poker, Dew examined the cellar floor. He saw that one of the bricks was loose. He eased out the brick and lifted up several more. Only a few inches beneath, he hit what he quickly saw was a mass of flesh and matter. The stench was unbearable, and Dew fled to the garden for fresh air. At that moment, Dew knew that the ghastly mess could well be the mortal remains of Mrs. Crippen. The pathologist identified human organs, liver, spleen, heart and kidney, and flesh, which had been filleted from the bones. The skeleton had been completely removed which suggested that a person with knowledge of medicine had been responsible for an anatomical dissection. 
Parts of the body which would have indicated the sex were missing, and the head was also not present. But tufts of blonde hair dark at the roots, some still clasped by metal hair curlers were found. Cora Crippen, though a brunette, had for some time been dyeing her hair blonde. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Crippen and his female companion, his secretary and mistress, Ethel Leneve. Descriptions and pictures of Crippen and Leneve were seen throughout the country. The story was front page news. The public's imagination was caught by the heady mix of the gruesome cellar discovery and the affair between Crippen and a much younger woman. The police extended the search around the world. There were dozens of sightings of the couple. One man thought to be Crippen narrowly escaped lynching by an excited crowd. But nearly two weeks later, there was still no convincing sighting of the couple. Then, late one evening, Inspector Dew was handed a telegram that would dramatically alter the course of the investigation. The telegram was from a ship called the Montrose, which had sailed out of Antwerp and was bound for Quebec, Canada. Amongst the passengers were a father and son, both called John Robinson. After two days at sea, the ship's captain, Henry Kendall, became struck by the likeness of the Robinsons to the newspaper photos he had seen of the cellar murder fugitive and his friend. He also noticed that the father and his very attractive son would hold hands and gaze at each other. So convinced was he that he had Crippen and Ethel and Eve on his ship that he ordered the Marconi operator to send a telegraph message to the Canadian Pacific office in Liverpool. It read, have strong suspicions that Crippen, London cellar murderer and accomplice are amongst passengers. Moustache taken off, growing beard, accomplice dressed as a boy, voice, manner and build, undoubtedly a girl. Everyone involved was sworn to secrecy, but somehow the papers got hold of it. The chase was now on to capture the suspected murderer. As Dew began his mission, the whole world was watching. A rhyme was set to a popular song asking, has anybody here seen Crippen? C-R-I-P-P-E-N. He's done a bunk to Canada and left his wife in a coal cellar. Has anybody here seen Crippen? Crippen from Camden Town. The news that the Marconi Telegraph was crucial to the whole drama created great interest. The Cripping case was the great turning point, I think, for radio, because it was such a sensational case. It was such a sensational arrest of somebody miles and miles away, just through the transmission and reception of wireless messages through the air. It established it in the public mind. It showed how wireless could be useful in commerce, in military communications. And two years after the 1910 Crippen case, it came in very handy for the Titanic, when, of course, wireless emphasized itself again by saving many hundreds of lives. Captain Kendall did his utmost to ensure that the suspect remained ignorant of the fact that their identity had been discovered. At the start of the voyage, he removed any copy of a newspaper found lying around the ship. He was fully aware of the intense media interest in the situation, and again, using the wireless telegraph, he agreed terms with British and North American newspapers and supplied them with daily reports on the Robinsons. They spent a lot of time reading, or pretending to read. It was noticed that Crippen had a habit of stroking his growing beard. The captain noted that they both had hearty appetites. He also wrote about the marked attention that Crippen paid to his so-called son, and the endearing looks the boy gave him in return. Kendall even managed to take a secret photograph of the couple. So, as the telegraph wires were furiously working over their heads, two of the world's most wanted were relaxing on board ship, ignorant of the fact that their every move was relayed around the world, and that another ship, the Laurentic, 
was fast on their heels, carrying a Scotland Yard detective. Crippin was invited by the captain to uh, dinner in his cabin. And in fact, they talked about wireless, and Crippin remarked what a wonderful thing wireless was. He didn't quite know at that point how wonderful it would be for his case. To avoid the press, Inspector Dew decided to board the boat before Quebec. On the 31st of July, just 12 hours before they finally docked, Crippin watched from the deck as two men climbed onto the Montrose at a place called Father Point. Dew, disguised as a ship's pilot, took one look at Mr. Robinson and said, Good morning, Dr. Crippin. It had been a long three weeks since they had last met. Crippin gave a start, then quietly replied, Good morning, Mr. Dew. Dew then entered the cabin where Ethel and Eve was reading a penny dreadful. When he revealed his identity, she screamed and promptly fainted. Crippen and Ethel were both arrested. Caught with the help of the wireless telegraph, history had been made. The invisible lines of telegraph communication had put Crippen and Ethel and Eve in a glass cage and had helped to capture them. Now their lives would be scrutinized in a way that would keep the public spellbound. Once in Liverpool, Crippen and Ethel and Eve were subjected to crowds of shouting and screaming people eager for a glimpse of the evil doctor. At his trial, Crippen pleaded not guilty to the murder of his wife. The trial attracted maximum attention. It focused on two things, the complicated medical evidence and the question of Crippen's motive for murder. Dr. Crippen had married Cora 18 years before in their Native America. He had doted on his plump, colorful wife. He supported her quest for a musical career, which owing to the fact that her voice was unexceptional and quavery, now focused on the music hall rather than the opera. Crippen had trained as a doctor, chiefly in the American city of Cleveland. But in the years after his marriage to Cora, America was in the grip of an economic depression. Doctors' bills were often unpaid. And so, at Cora's suggestion, he turned his back on conventional medicine and looked to the patent quack line of remedies as an easier way of making money. In 1897, he had travelled to England to open the London branch of the Munion Homeopathic Home Remedy Company. His wife soon followed, now calling herself Belle Elmore, hopeful of singing to packed houses in London's top musical venues. Her career was a flop, but she found an outlet in a benevolent organisation called the Music Hall Ladies Guild and became their treasurer. Accounts of the Crippins remark on his support of the demanding, difficult Cora and his outward devotion to her. To keep up with her desire for expensive clothes and jewellery, Crippin supplemented his salary by acting as a consultant to several other companies which offered dubious medical cures. It was at one, the Druitt Institute for the Deaf, that he met a young typist called Ethel and Eve. She was the exact opposite of Mrs. Crippin, by 1905, Ethel was the doctor's mistress. He took refuge with his uh, lady typewriter, Ethel, who uh, was a much quieter, I think, submissive person. The Crippen's marriage was unravelling at the seams. While Crippen was out at work, Cora often entertained gentlemen callers. Cora knew all about Ethel, and Crippen looked the other way from his wife's romances. Why or when this state of affairs became intolerable is not clear. But what is known is that on the 31st of January 1910, after dining with her husband and a couple of friends at Hilldrop Crescent, Cora Crippen was never seen again. At the trial, the prosecuting counsel, Richard Muir, gathered together a mass of incriminating evidence against Crippen, and he reminded the jury that after Cora's disappearance, Crippen had spun a web of lies. In March, Crippen had spread word that he had heard from America that Cora was dangerously ill. 
Then, a fortnight later, he had placed an obituary in the theatrical paper, The Era, announcing that Belle Elmore, Mrs. Crippen, had died in California. And shortly after the disappearance, Ethel, who was by then living with Crippen, had accompanied him to a charity ball, mingling with many of his wife's theatrical friends. It was noticed that Ethel was wearing Cora's jewelry. During the trial, two crucial pieces of medical evidence emerged. The first concerned the identity of the victim. Found amongst the remains in the cellar had been a small piece of skin bearing a trace of a scar. With the theatricality that characterized the whole proceedings, the piece of flesh was passed around the court on a soup plate. The scar was controversially identified as being identical to one Cora Crippen had had on her stomach. The second crucial finding was the result of the chemical analysis of the remains, which revealed the presence of a narcotic, hyacine. Hyacine isn't really a poison. Uh, I think perhaps a lot of people think it is, but it, it's a really a very harmless drug and, in fact, is available over the counter today in uh, any pharmacy. Uh, it's uh, the component of, um, of travel sickness pills because it's, it's a muscle relaxant. The reason why Cripping came to grief on it was that he ordered so much of it. He ordered five grains from a chemist in London that January. And uh, really, the therapeutic dose is a hundredth to a two hundredth of a grain. Half a grain's a lethal dose. To order five grains, well, it probably cleaned the chemist out and I would think would immediately be suspicious. Cripping could not account for the fact that all of the hyacin was now missing from his office. It's said that he had read the books of the American toxicologist Rudolf August Whithouse, and um, he confirmed that it was undetectable in the body, uh, but also said two very interesting things, that uh, there's usually no pain, and if the victim should recover, usually has no memory of the events while under the influence of the poison, which um, is, is the ideal, it was the ideal poison for the wife murderer. If Crippen believed he had found the perfect drug to rid himself of his wife, he was wrong. Technology had advanced. By 1910, it was possible to detect hyacinth scientifically. The body had been filleted. Where had all the bones gone? A neighbor whose garden backed onto Crippen's recalled a huge bonfire that had burned in the Crippen's garden for several days. And a dustman remembered that he had collected a great deal of white ash. The prosecution suggested that these were the remains of Cora Crippen's bones. When the gory remains had been removed from their makeshift grave, there had been amongst them a man's pyjama jacket still bearing the manufacturer's label. The pyjama label said uh, Jones Brothers Holloway Limited, and Crippen's defence, poor though it was, was that a previous tenant of the house must have murdered his wife and buried her in the cellar and it was nothing to do with him. And he'd taken the tenancy over in uh, 1905. Unfortunately for him, the buyer at uh, Jones Brothers was called in to court and uh, it, it was shown that it became a limited company in 1906. So uh, that was really the clincher. Crippen had the misfortune to have engaged a solicitor whose only interest in the case was to make money. He never mounted a credible defence. After only five days, Dr Crippen was sentenced to death for the murder of his wife. Crippen had emerged from the obscurity of the London suburbs to become one of the most infamous figures of his day. Yet all who met him, even Inspector Dew, described him as a most unlikely murderer. But love, one that had soured and one that was deep and fresh, was at the heart of this crim passionnel. Crippen showed no emotion when his wife was mentioned. It was Ethel and Neve who occupied all his thoughts. He went out of his way to deflect any blame from her. And just four days after he was found guilty, she was acquitted as being an accessory to the crime. And it is Ethel who provides the most intriguing element of the story, her cross-dressing role in the whole saga had captured the public's imagination, and despite being shy and demure, she actually posed in her boy's outfit for a national newspaper. 
However, on the day of Crippen's execution, Ethel sailed the Atlantic once more, settling in Toronto. A couple of years later, now calling herself Ethel Harvey, Crippen's middle name, she returned to England. And eventually, she married Stanley Smith, a bookkeeper. When I was compiling a book about the Crippen case, I decided I would try to find her children. Ethel had died in 1967, but I traced her son, Bob Smith. I wrote to him and received a letter by return. I think he thought I was a lunatic. He had no idea what I was writing to him about. And first thing I thought, well, if this is true, surely we, one of us would have heard somewhere about it. In 75 years, it's an impossibility. She never said a word. All I knew that she'd been to Canada. But why? I wondered just how much she really knew about the murder of Crippen's wife. I'm sure she must have known something yeah. about it. I mean, she was such a sensible person. Yeah. Surely she would have yeah. tweaked something. It was very wrong when he wanted yeah. her to go Cody. dressed as a boy. boy. And yeah. Yeah. That's, When she died, there were so many things that seemed to vanish into the blue. <laughs> She'd done, I the only thing really don't know. Didn't was that blue scarf she had when she was in uh, in, in court. The dock. No, I used to play with it. Play with it. Was this... But yeah. I mean, not knowing anything about yeah, it, obviously, it. it got old and tatty, yeah. and I dumped it. Yeah. Now we know quite a bit about it. We can feel very sorry for her because she must have missed uh, a lot out of life at times. Well, she must have been a very yeah. unhappy woman, I think, yeah. most of the time. Mm. Mm. Ethel was always good at keeping secrets. The most enduring legacy from the case is the wireless telegraph. In terms of extending communications in the pursuit of criminals, it was the start of international policing. Today it is the internet that is at the forefront of police communications. DCI Barry Howe was recently commended for being the first officer to catch a criminal with the help of the internet. The congratulatory speech recalled the Crippen case and showed the links in terms of policing from 1910 to the present day. I went to look at his address, which is now demolished in Camden Town, and I asked the taxi driver how many people he thought Crippen had killed, and he was convinced he was a mass murderer, and yet he just had murdered his wife. A commonplace little crime. As Dr. Hawley Harvey Crippen and countless criminals after him have learnt, no matter how far a fugitive travels, he is never completely beyond the long arm of the law. A profile of the FBI's investigation into political corruption is coming up next in the FBI Files, The Dixie Mafia.